Hi guys, thanks for joining me once again for another round of Saturday Stories. I've got four great stories for you today. Um, before I get into the stories, I just want to answer a question that gets asked um, a lot of times. When I have contact with people, when they email me or leave comments, uh, or some people know my line, app ID, that sort of thing. Uh, one of the questions that I get asked more than any other question is, is Thailand busy at the moment? Is it quiet? How is Pattaya? Are there many people there? Um, so I'll just tell you very briefly, yes, it is fairly quiet now. We're into uh, low season. The rainy season started. It really gets underway uh, come July, but it's not dead. Uh, you'll, you'll see people write on forums and things about Pattaya. They'll say, oh, it's dead. There's nobody here. Well, Pattaya is never dead because there's always tour groups there. There's always people visiting. People get holidays at different times of the year. So you'll always find people down there. But yeah, I, I noticed a big difference now. I was there a couple of weeks ago. I'm heading down there this week weekend again and uh, yeah you notice when you're in tree town for instance a lot of the bars don't have anybody or they have one or two customers whereas one or two other bars will be quite busy there seems to be some bars that do really well and some bars that kind of tick over so the ones that tick over uh, are not very busy this time of year and the other thing I've noticed in Bangkok a lot of the restaurants that I go to uh, I don't go to that many, but when I go out, there's a, one or two restaurants that I like. Sometimes you can't get a seat. It's just so busy. You get there that wrong at 7.30. Uh, there's no seats. But now, this time of year, you're all, you always get a seat. Uh, and in fact, one of the places I uh, couldn't get a seat about six months ago was a patty of beer garden, which I like. It's very nice at sunset with the... Um, you know, looking over the bay, uh, but this time of year, you're pretty much guaranteed a seat, okay? So you're not here to uh, hear, listen to me waffle on about how busy Thailand is. You're here for the stories. As I say, we've got four stories today. Let's get straight into the first one. I'm a 33-year-old guy from the UK. I've had eight previous trips to Pattaya. Not sure this story is applicable, but might be worthwhile ca a cautionary tale for fellow travellers. On my recent trip to Pattaya, I spent the night on Walking Street visiting gogo bars but didn't bar fine. I got back to my room but had the urge for some aerobics. I started messaging girls on Thai Friendly, which for your viewers who haven't had the experience is, frustra is a frustrating process at 3am trying to arrange a quick encounter. I finally get a girl to agree to visit. She says she will be arriving in 10 minutes, but I know I'll likely be waiting 30 minutes if I'm lucky. That's Thai time. I've had quite a bit to drink, so I decide to take a blue pill to help things along. The lady arrives and we complete a sweaty session of aerobics. She leaves and I get some sleep. I wake an hour later feeling nauseous and lightheaded. I go to the toilet in case I need to vomit. I'm standing looking in the mirror Next thing, I'm face down on the floor, not remembering why I decided to lie down on the floor in my bathroom. I came to the realisation that I've passed out. I slowly stand up, leaning on the sink, feeling numb. Things go black, and again I wake up on the floor, passing out for a second time, but this time my face is wet with my blood. This time I can't stand up or raise myself. I lay on the floor, I slowly drag myself into the bedroom and lay on the floor. After an hour, I have the strength to pull myself into bed. All I think about is not getting blood on the white bed sheets. I can barely sleep. I have pain through my whole body and I'm feeling incredibly groggy and shocked. After rest, I'm able to get out of bed. I inspect the damage, not much sign of blood on the bed apart from some smears. A lot of blood on the bathroom floor, but luckily the bum gun is shockingly powerful and makes quick work of blasting it all down the drain. I check myself in the mirror. I have a small gash on the right side of my head, a couple of inches above my temple. I have five large bruises on my shins, on my shoulder blade. I have a large friction burn. I most likely have a broken tailbone also due to the dull pain in my lower back and I cannot sit straight. I feel like I've been beaten and kicked all over. I go back to bed. I was trying to figure out what happened and it suddenly hits me. Something similar happened on my last trip six months ago. On my last trip, I was spending the night at a girl's apartment as she preferred that as she has a normal day job and made, it made it easier for her. That night, we ate a meal together. I bought some blue pills from a pharmacy on Soy Diana and we enjoyed an evening together. I woke up in the, in the night with my stomach gargling and I rushed to the toilet. I had diarrhea and then vomited. 
While I was composing myself on the toilet, I blacked out, but luckily didn't fall to the floor, instead fell against the wall. I stood to wash my face as the sink blacked, blacked out again. I woke up face down on the floor, confused, not remembering, making the decision to sleep on the bathroom floor. On this occasion, I only had a bit of soreness on my ribs and hip from the fall. Luckily, my Thai girl slept through the whole thing. I had food poisoning that lasted a few days, so I put the fainting down to that and not the medication I had just bought from a pharmacy and a product that I had used before with no issues. Not sure why this happened, not sure whether if it's a dodgy batch that the pills come from. I've lost 85 pounds in the last year or so. Not sure if this means the dose was too much for me now. I'm going to play it safe and stop using this kind of bedroom medication, even though I don't need it since my weight loss. I still like to take it as a guarantee and it certainly made me stronger in the aerobics department. It's not worth the risk. I feel lucky I didn't hurt myself worse considering the situation. All the falls happened in bathrooms and the falls could have been much worse and I could have got a serious injury from hitting my head on the toilet or bath. I started going back out after two nights after the incident. The girls were impressed with my leg bruises. All were adamant it must have been a bike incident and they showed off their scars. Three days later, I caught an STD while getting a special massage, so no more aerobics for the rest of my trip. Not much success on this trip, but this player is no quitter, so I won't let this put me off. I'm planning my next trip in six months' time. You know what? I, I've never heard of this before. He's obviously talking about Viagra, and, uh, you know, they're so safe, actually. The NHS in the UK prescribe them to guys uh, if, if it's not all working in that department, as they say. Um, I don't know. He said he bought it from a pharmacy, but the um, pharmacies in Pattaya, Pattaya, where do they get them from? We don't know. I would certainly not. I would certainly recommend not buying any of these liquids and pills off guys on the street. You know, you get guys come around the bars selling this stuff. I definitely, you know, if it was me, I wouldn't buy from there. I would go to a pharmacy, but um, I've not heard of it before. Maybe he had some kind of reaction, but he said he'd taken them in the past. So I don't know. Uh, I don't think it's anything to worry about for guys who take them regular. Um, no idea. Okay, let's jump into story number two. I was hooked to these gogo bars from the start. I could not forget everything happened in my personal life. I really like the music in some of the gogo bars in Nana Plaza and Soy Cowboy in Bangkok. After trial and error, I became regular to one gogo bar in Nana Plaza and one gogo bar in Soy Cowboy. I would spend quite a bit every day in these gogo bars and just sit there for five to six hours enjoying the music and company of the girls. I bar find a couple of girls a few times and just took them out for dinner or playing pool in other bars. I never had aerobics with these girls, but believe me, everything else was done inside the gogo bars, which I preferred. It's a bit of a different story in Pattaya, as I am of an Indian origin. Some of the gogo bars in Pattaya Walking Street wouldn't allow me inside. Some of them allowed me only after seeing a copy of my British passport. One bar in particular welcomed me without asking anything. The Mamasan even guessed that I'm from England and she told me her reasoning behind this situation with me and some gogo bars. I won't explain that here as it may sound a bit odd. If you are interested in covering this as a separate topic, I can write to you. Actually, this may help some of your Indian or Indian origin listeners to have a better experience in Pattaya as many freelancers that I have spoken to told me very similar points. Anyway, I started to enjoy my time in this gogo bar and become a regular. I didn't want to go to any others in Walker Street as they were not welcome, welcoming me and the girls in this gogo bar are better looking anyway. I would spend about 4,000 to 5,000 baht on average per night and have three girls sit with me regularly on their entire shift. Again, I did everything but aerobics. One of these girls even went to a couple of nightclubs with me on her day off without asking for any money. One who is about 21 and the most beautiful Thai girls I've ever met. Let's call her Nock. She asked that I bar find her before I go back to England, so I did. The bar fine for her was 2,500 baht and she wanted 3,000 baht for herself for the night. I met her in Tree Town for a quick snack around 9pm and planned to go to, walk in, to some walking street clubs. I met a few guys on this trip who opened a VIP table in a nightclub and invited me to join them, so I went there with Nock. 
All of them congratulated me for having a very beautiful girl with me and felt jealous. After 15 minutes or so, Nock told me she didn't like West Western music and that she wants me to experience a Thai nightclub. I do like Thai music, so I said, why not? She then told me her sister works in a tomboy club and I can experience a different type of Thai club if I go there. I was not comfortable, but I said okay in the end, as I was planning to have aerobics with her later and I didn't want to upset her by saying no. Off we went in a taxi and arrived at this tomboy club. As soon as we went inside, four or five tomboys jumped on her and thanked her for bringing me. I have to say, I really enjoyed the music and the whole experience there. I'm not into whiskey, but they made me drink 20 shots of Thai whiskey somehow, and I was drunk. We were there drinking and dancing until 5 a.m., and I told Nock that it's time to go back to the hotel. The total bill was about 10,000 baht for the two bottles of Thai whiskey I bought, and tomboy time. They drink from these bottles, but you pay 250 baht per hour for their time. We went to the hotel at 5.30 a.m., and I told her that I really enjoyed the night out, and I was looking forward to take her into the next level. She then told me she needs to leave by 6 a.m. as this was the maximum time she could spend and asked me to pay 6,000 baht. I knew she told me it's 3,000 baht previously. I was very disappointed with the whole thing and in no mood to argue with her. I gave her 6,000 baht and told her to leave immediately. Off she went, not even looking back. After this day, I never went to that gogo bar again as I know I will be upset as soon as I see her face. In hindsight, I did realise I spent far too much money in these go-go bars. I still think I will go to these settings in my next trip, but stick to one girl at a time and not spend too much money. Definitely no aerobics with these girls though. I had my fair share of freelancers, I met a couple of them in Bangkok near my hotel and had a decent experience with them. We went to beer bars, played pool and had dinner together and then back to the hotel. In Pattaya, I met a few girls in Walking Street nightclubs and went back to my hotel with them a few times. I never did short time, that's not my style. Most of these girls wanted 3,000 baht for long time, so I went along with this option as it gave me enough time to get to know them a little bit before the action started. I met one girl on Thai Friendly. She's 23, let's call her Far. I first contacted her on my second trip to Thailand and she took me to some live music clubs in Pattaya. She never asked me to buy food in a restaurant, she simply brought a few bits from 7-Eleven including a couple of drinks. She didn't want me to spend money on expensive drinks in clubs and bars. We had great aerobics and I gave her 4,000 baht per meet. The same continued in my third trip too. I was chatting to Far sometimes on the line app after returning back to England. I informed her about my plans to visit Pattaya again and she expressed her happiness. This was my most recent and fourth trip where I spent a month in Thailand. She suddenly went silent a few weeks before my trip. I called her one day and she was crying. After asking what happened, she told me she was ill for a few days and the doctor told her that she must reduce her alcohol intake. She has shown me a lot of medicine and her hospital scans, etc. She told me she didn't work for a couple of weeks and she's feeling stressed about paying rent, etc. But never asked me for any money. After a couple of days, I asked her to send me a scanned copy of her ID and I transferred 8,000 baht to her. She called me to thank me and said I don't need to pay her uh, the next time when I meet her in, a, in my upcoming trip to Pattaya. I arrived in Pattaya as planned and she came to my hotel on that day. I took her out for a walk and asked her about her health, etc. We went back to the hotel and had a good night. After breakfast in the morning, she said she wants to go to her apartment and come back in the evening if I wanted her to. I said I will meet her the next day as I was planning to go to Gogo Bars. She started walking out of the hotel but didn't ask for any money. I decided to give her 4,000 baht anyway, but she refused. I arranged to meet her again the next day and we also spent the night together. She refused to take money again. I took her for a morning walk and I asked her about her life. She told me that she doesn't go out to meet many new customers unless they meet her for a drink or dinner first so she can get to know them a little. She has a few regular customers that she meets when they come to visit Pattaya. As a result, she doesn't earn money every day, but she is still spending money on nights out with her friends drinking and dancing. This means she has no savings and she is always feeling stressed about her rent and bills. 
She has a five-year-old daughter living in Pattaya in the same apartment and looked after by her mother, who also works in a local market, cooking Thai food on a stall. She gave birth to her daughter when she was 17, and the Thai boyfriend disappeared shortly after the birth. Her daughter has never seen her father. I asked a bit more about her daughter and saw the pictures. Her daughter was lovely. I didn't have kids myself and I thought I would treat this kid. I asked Far to meet me outside the hotel the next day and bring her daughter with her. I took them both to the Patia Dolphin Show. The kid was shy at the beginning and slowly started looking at me and asking if she could sit on my lap as she couldn't see the dolphins properly from her seat. I was surprised by this as she didn't ask Far but came to me instead. After the show, I brought her some sweets and asked if she wants to buy anything else. She told me she wants to buy a kid's scooter. I promised her that I will buy that scooter soon. After a couple of days, I met Far again in the daytime in my hotel when she was leaving in the evening. I sat her down and gave her two envelopes with 5,000 baht in each one. I wrote her daughter's name on each of these envelopes. I told Far that I helped her when she was stressed out about money, but I didn't want to pay her for the time that she spends with me. Since she refused to take money for the first two meetings, I didn't want to give her money again and instead gave the money to her daughter. I opened the calculator app on her phone and showed her how much she can save in five years if she can save 5,000 baht per month in an envelope for her daughter every month. She was shocked and said it's not difficult to save 5,000 baht a month. I told her that these two envelopes, envelopes are for the first two months of her daughter's savings plan and she should continue to do this every month from now on. I gave her some lessons about basic finance and savings. She wrote down these points in her phone, which surprised me. She thanked me for giving her some ideas about saving money for her daughter and went home. I met her daughter a few more times, bought her a scooter and took her to the Central Festival to buy some clothes, etc. She was the happiest kid in town. One day, I didn't meet Far, but I went to the local market on my own where the grandmother worked and looked after her daughter. The daughter saw me from a distance and ran towards me. She hugged me and wanted me to hold her hand all the time. She displayed some of the skills she had learned playing with the scooter. I took her to the nearest 7-Eleven to buy some sweets. When walking to the shop, some of the market people started asking her who I was. This kid introduced me to them as her father. I was shocked and somehow felt emotional. I sat down near a table and this kid was playing hide and seek with me. A foreigner came to me and said, your daughter looks very cute. I didn't know what was happening. I said bye to the kid and went back to my hotel. I met Far the next day and told her what happened the night before. She called her mother's phone and started talking to her daughter on video call and asked her why she thought I was her father. The kids started explaining that she thought I am her father because I'm playing with her, buying toys and sweets, t taking her to shows, etc. And only fathers do this. Far told her that I'm only a friend, but the kid insisted that she knows I am her father. I didn't know what to say. I had mixed feelings about whether to upset, upset the kid by saying I am not the father or to continue to make her feel happy that she suddenly found her father in her mind. I told Far that I don't mind taking talking to her when I get back to England. I'm happy to advise her about her future, etc. I told her that I won't send any money and that she needs to follow the savings plan on her own. She was happy with this. I met Far a few more times and she came to the airport to send me off to the UK. I reiterated to her that I don't have any feelings for her and I only give her ideas about how to save money as, as a well-wisher. She said she knows that and thanked me again with tears in her eyes. After coming back to England, I continued to talk to Far via the Line app and had video calls with her daughter a couple of times. Far told me that her daughter asks about me every single day and she wants to go to London to stay with her father. Far explained to her that I work in London and only visit Patia when I'm having holidays. On the video calls, the kids started to show me her schoolwork then realized I may be doing something wrong by creating an impression in a child's mind that she now has a father. If I find a partner in my post-divorce life, or if I can't visit Patia many times or stop focusing on this kid for whatever reason, she will be heartbroken. 
So after consulting with a couple of friends and far, we decided that I should slowly reduce the calls and make her realize that I may not be her real father as I'm not spending much time with her. I stopped making video calls to the kid for a few weeks and she still asks about me, but less frequently. If I'm in a position to do so, I will happily take care of this kid, but I don't want to commit yet as my personal future is uncertain or not clear yet. Until then, I will stay away from Far's daughter as much as I can. I still think about her and I look at her pictures every now and then and feel happy. Far started saving money and brought a small safe. She makes a video call and counts the total savings kept in that safe every couple of weeks. I hope she will continue to do this and her daughter will have enough money to go to a nice college or university in the future. I will keep an eye on this as long as I can. Isn't that a nice story? It was one of those stories, uh, it's a little bit sad and it's also happy at the same time, isn't it? Because the guy obviously felt, uh, you know, he had some kind of relation with the uh, Far's child there and obviously he would have been prepared to take her on knowing his situation was better but you know you can't help but feel sorry for the kid right you know she kind of got a bit emotional attached to the guy and he didn't kind of work out um, I'm sure that happens quite a bit right let's let's jump straight into story number three now I've been binging on your videos lately from my condo on soy 21 directly next to terminal 21 in Bangkok and they've helped me get over a tremendous bruise to my ego I decided to share my story of my first few months in Thailand. I'm a 54-year-old African-American, although when I came to Thailand I was still 53. I planned my trip from Beverly Hills in January of 2023 to visit Thailand for the first time and stay two months. I planned on being in Bangkok for the first month and then travelling to Pattaya for the, for the second to attend the first ever Rolling Loud Music Festival along with Songkran, which is actually my birthday on April the 15th. I rented Airbnbs beforehand for the entire trip, including a pool villa in Pattaya for the week of my birthday, the festival and Songkran. I've owned restaurants in my past and constantly day trade to make a living, so I had means to plan ahead. I spent my first week pretty much shopping and enjoying street food along with a few night spots along Carlson Road and really didn't venture into beer bars or go-go's as it's really not my thing. I have no problem with the adult entertainment venues in Thailand and I've often visited massage parlors in the States as well as the occasional high-end dinner date. The truth is I came to Thailand to experience the food, culture and islands more than the woman. I also talked a neighbour of mine back in Los Angeles to join me for a week and attend the festival as well. We split the cost of the pool villa and each brought VIP tickets to the three day event. I was going to be here for five weeks before him and figured I'd have a good lay of the land by the time he got to Thailand. I arrived the last day of February and a week later myself and another guy I met from Los Angeles decided to venture to Soy 11 and visit a popular nightclub. This was my first time seeing freelancers everywhere, walking the streets. When we got to the club, it was kind of empty as it was Tuesday at around 10.30pm. Even in this thin crowd, I spotted the first woman I wanted to meet since arriving in town. She was with a friend and they were drinking wine and the first thing my friend said was, I think they're freelancers. Being naive at the time, I said, I hope not, as I sent them each another glass of wine. When they came over to thank us, the first thing I asked the one I was interested in before I asked her name was, are you working? And she said with a straight face, no. She said her name was Dang and she was 44 as I thought, wow, she's a good age and still pretty cute. I told her I was in town for a couple of months and that I would be attending the music festival. She got excited and said she would also be going to the festival. The connection seemed in instantaneous at the same time, I looked over my shoulder to see my friend had his arms wrapped firmly around the other girl and they were already lip-locked. I continued my conversation as if I had seen nothing. Dang and I exchanged WhatsApp info and she said she had to get up for work and would be leaving shortly. She actually left abruptly without so much as a goodbye and when we got downstairs, her friend informed us she was probably halfway home as she suddenly had no affection left for my friend now that we were on the street. He summed it up as her probably having a man somewhere nearby because this was like a night and day in five minutes as far as he was concerned. I would later find out that she lives less than 100 metres away on Soy 11 with another African-American guy. 
I text Dang that she hadn't said goodbye and she texts back that it was a nice it was nice meeting me also and added no judgment please for some reason the next day she sent a selfie and began telling me about her office work helping thai women that had married foreigners get their visas to travel to europe mostly england she added the day after she sent me a video of her lunch a beef soup at around noon with a caption lunch with co-workers I sent back a picture of me in the gym at around 11 p.m. that night. I got a call from Dan, Dang cursing me out royally for not saying enjoy your lunch when she sent the video of her meal. There were a lot of F-bombs dropped from her over the next hour as I sat wondering, does this girl like me this much that this matters anyway? Call me toxic because it kind of turned me on that she made a fuss about such a small matter with someone she met for 10 minutes just two days ago. However... During that conversation, she tilted her hand big time and asked me, are you rich enough to talk to me? Can you afford me? These are the words I've never heard in my life from a gold digger before. The next morning, Dang texts me an apology and said she had been drinking and said some mean things. As you know, sorry isn't a woman in a woman's vocabulary in the West, so I accepted and let bygones be bygones. I had never forgot that one part of the conversation, though, with those two absurd questions. She then invited me to Pattaya for the weekend, saying she had a home there and spent every weekend. I accepted. We arrived at her house and I saw she also had a small car, and I admit I was impressed. It was a two-bedroom, two-bathroom home on a nice lot with a few mango trees as well. Dang told me she had been married for 10 years to a British guy and he bought and built the home. Knowing what I know now, I've already ignored a half a dozen red flags. No decent, hard-working Thai woman is caught dead on Soy 11. She rudely exited the night we met, cursed me out, questioned my worth, lived in Pattaya for 20 years, has a wealthy ex-husband who bought a house and a car. The fact is, when asked if I could afford her, my ego kicked in and I thought to myself, I'm going to sleep with this woman as much as possible but spend as little as possible. Needless to say, we participated in aerobics that first night in Pattaya and all weekend in that house. When we got back to Bangkok, the honeymoon was over. I was staying in the Satorn area of Bangkok with Dang stayed on Soy 13, a block away from where we had met. She came to see me but found it inconvenient getting to work in the morning. The next few days was like a tug of war. We had passionate interactions and more passionate disagreements. I wanted to explore Thai cuisine and street food. Dang preferred proper restaurants. My determination to make sure she didn't get what she wanted out of me was always a source of disagreement. While I told her of some of the things she said the night she drunkenly cursed me out, I always admitted the part that mattered most to me where she showed me her true gold digging motives. By the time my neighbour arrived the first week of April, Dang and I had grown seemingly close even though I would never trust her. In her own way, though, she was an asset when it came to navigating all things Thailand for my friend and myself. My friends started looking at Tinder and made plenty of connections in Bangkok and Pattaya. The second day of Rolling Loud, he ran into a girl he had matched with and they ended up spending the night together. Dang and I had the pool villa to ourselves that night and got into another fight as I went through her phone and discovered a handful of men were, get, were getting good morning, my love, and good night text. All of my suspicions were confirmed at this point, but my ego told me I was sleeping with this woman too much to care that these other idiots were sponsoring her because I knew I never would. The next day was Songkran, April 15, my birthday, and Dang bought me a cake and plenty of booze along with a super soaker to participate in the festivities. We went to Second Road and my friend and I ventured down Soy 6 and I had a blast with our water guns while Dang and her friend waited for us. I have to say... I've never had as much fun as I had going on Soy 6 for the end, from one end to the other. Dang told us Songkran didn't end until the 19th in Pattaya, so my friend who was leaving the 16th changed his ticket until the 20th. That Sunday, the 16th, Dang's friend was having a phone party at her restaurant on Beach Road, and we all attended. My friend bought the girl he had spent the night with a couple of nights before with him and surprisingly, I happened to catch her coming out of the bathroom with another guy. It was obvious what they had been doing while he was on the street. Once I told him what I'd seen, the evening was over. Dang and I drove them back to his hotel and I watched her pack her things to ensure nothing went wrong and she might make something up. 
When we got downstairs, she claimed she lost her phone and wasted another 20 minutes of our time. Dang let her use the, her phone. I couldn't understand why she cared after what this girl had just done. When my friend left town a few days later, we traveled to Suran, Surin in Isan so Dan could visit her family. I stayed in a hotel nearby and met no one. Yet in the weeks that followed, I was asked to do all kinds of things for these people I wasn't good enough to meet. In one story, a tire came off a moving lorry and struck her father's parked truck. In another, her niece needed a new laptop. Despite everything, I saw in her phone, Dang was constantly trying to hustle me. I was constantly making sure she didn't. I did, however, rent a condo on Soy 21 next to Terminal 21 to be close to her work. And by mid-May, Dang and I had had enough of trying to outwit each other and parted ways for good. I had a 23,000 baht room, was being asked for 30,000 baht allowance, and every two weeks we'd argued and had been apart for at least four days that I know others were being serviced. Dang was an undercover freelancer, and those are the most dangerous kind as they sleep with you in front and give you the true girlfriend experience. There are more of them than massage girls, bar girls, and freelancers put together. Make no mistakes, the entrepreneurial freelancer that has a day job outnumbers them all. I was given meals, laundry, done birthday presents and had access to her house when she was in Bangkok and I was in Pattaya and it was all part of the game to make sponsor number who knows. As you can imagine, that was when I decided to walk away for, from Dang for good and I'm much wiser these days. So that's actually the last story there. I thought there were four, there's actually three. But yeah, great little story. But that's, that is a good warning. I put out a video, it must have been two to three years ago, so I can't remember the exact title of it, but it was called something like um, 20 points to find out if your Thai girlfriend is genuine. And, and there are certain tests you can do. If you meet a girl and you're not sure and you think, well, sh she could be a freelancer pretending to be a decent girl. I mean, the, the most obvious one is her phone. If you can get access to the phone and you see foreign guys on that phone, then obviously uh, she's playing games, okay? The other thing is, if you go out for meals, if she's constantly on her phone, what you can do, she's not gonna let you see uh, what she what she does but what you can do is you can say I'm going to the toilet and uh, you know just go off for 10 seconds and then kind of I know it's a bit uh, a bit of a creepy thing to do but you just come back and you can kind of look over her shoulder from a little bit of distance and you can see who she's who she's texting you know and, and it might it might sound uh, a little bit weird doing things like that but you have to do it because especially in a tourist area you know like this guy says you know these girls are very very clever and you might think you've got yourself, um, you know, the loveliest girl in the world. And she's actually, uh, as he said, servicing several guys or lots of guys. Um, there was there was about 20 tips on that video. If you're not sure and you've met somebody, I'd definitely recommend uh, watching that. Other things like, um, you know, when you order meals, if she fills the table with with food. It happened to a guy recently. I, I think I mentioned this before. I, I met a guy at the bottom of my street where I live. And uh, he'd, he'd, um, somebody had told him you can't take girls out of Hooters. So he was up for a challenge. He met this girl after work and uh, she ordered all this food. And when he went to the toilet, she actually ordered a lobster. And the bill came to, I think he said 7,000 baht. You know, I mean, that's absolutely ridiculous. For 7,000 baht, you can eat in a five-star hotel, you know, not on the street. Uh, you know, so cautionary tale there right okay we'll end on that on that uh we'll, we'll be a bit positive now we don't want to end on a negative note uh thanks for watching the listening to the stories again guys i'll be back next saturday there'll be more stories and um, once again if you've got a story please send it in i'll change the names and uh you can listen to your story uh one saturday morning okay thanks a lot and i'll i'll see you soon